Great. So uh, first of all, thank you, Tavi, for inviting me, but especially for organizing what I think has been a really great uh, seminar series uh, for this community and, and one that I think has really helped stay connected at this time when we cannot uh, travel and see each other. And I, I think this is a major service, especially to uh, the early career uh, members of this community. So my name is Fia Mastrano. I'm an oceanographer, a physical oceanographer. And um, as, as Tavi said about a decade ago, more like 12 years, um, my research direction took a new turn when I started working uh, to study the interaction of glaciers and oceans in Greenland. And um, this work ended up being quite different. I, I didn't really know about this going into it, but um, the difference is that many of the things that we learn when we work within our communities, which for me would have been the physical oceanography communities, are developed to work into a well-defined set of boxes. You work on research vessels, in my case, with teams and crews and the vessel predisposed to the kind of work uh, you have to do. So we can specialize a lot and uh, um, the sort of groundwork and, and the setting has been laid out by all the people who came before you. Uh, but when I got into this field, which is the interactions of ice sheets, of the Greenland ice sheets, so glaciers and oceans around Greenland, this was a new field. And um, in practice, what I'd like to try and summarize today is some of the lessons learned from working um, in what is a new field. So, um, great. Step one, advance. So just to give a scientific context, the first thing, the first remark is that the interaction of glaciers and oceans in Greenland is a societally relevant multidisciplinary problem. And I, I'd like to look at it from uh, two sort of motivational perspectives. The first one is uh, the ocean forcing of glaciers or, or the ice sheet. And there's a multitude of literature and a general scientific consensus by this community, at least at this time, that changes at the ice ocean interface through changes in submarine melting, uh, maybe weakening of the ice melange can trigger dynamic changes in Greenland glaciers and drive uh, sea level rise. So that, that's one reason to study this problem. The other one is the other side of this equation, which is as Greenland melts, it is discharging more fresh water into the ocean. Fresh water tends to change the ocean stratification. It can affect uh, regional, maybe even the large scale circulation, such as the overturning circulation shown here. It can also affect marine ecosystems through the transformation, upwelling of nutrients or discharge of nutrients. Marine ecosystem translate into changes in fisheries and, and sustenance for the local communities in Greenland and the Arctic that depend on them, as, as well as global communities. So this is the society relevant part. Uh, it's also an intrinsically multidisciplinary problem oceanographers, not just physical oceanographers, uh, biological oceanographers, marine mammals experts, um, ocean biogeochemists interested in this problem, just like on, on the climate side, glaciologists, ice sheet modelers, um, climate modelers, um, and ocean modelers are, are very interested. So, um, as I said earlier, I'm an observationalist and, and a lot of my work prior uh, to working at Greenland's margin was done off of nice research vessels. And, and really those are great. Once you have the funding, you walk with your laptop on the research vessel, everything is there and you just have to do your science. And in Greenland, it has turned out to be quite different. Uh, I have mostly been conducting work off of local vessels. This is just an example of some. Uh, of the vessels I've used over the last decade. Um, and we've also been adapting what are traditional and non-traditional 
observing platforms uh, to do research at the glacier's margin, moorings, autonomous vehicles, uh, water sampling of uh, tracers, helicopter work, and, and so on. And so the interesting part of developing new ways of observe um, is, is that you really have to work with a multitude of groups. And so in doing this work over the last 10 years, I've learned a lot of lessons. Many of them are technical in nature. Um, the picture shown shows a subsurface float of a mooring deployed in Sermelik Fjord at the edge of Helheim Glacier. It was destroyed by an iceberg that pushed it about 200 meters deeper uh, than it was deployed at. And so the lesson here would be not to use subsurface uh, flotation, which will implode when pushed down by an iceberg. It took a lot of time uh, to recover this. But so, so we've learned how to do the job and I'm really happy to share uh, what I've learned at any time, but I won't do this now. Um, I think the most interesting, but, but if you're interested, you can get in touch with me and I'd be really happy to do it um, any other time. But the most interesting things that I've learned is, you know, really how to do science with people. And so I'm going to start with lesson uh, number one, which is that science is not done by superstars, but it's done by teams. And this is such an obvious concept uh, that it feels even uh, silly to be standing here and saying this, except uh, I think every single recruitment meeting I've been at, at different institutions, there's always this urge of hiring the next superstar. Um, at every meeting I go to, somebody will say, you've got to go listen to this talk. He's amazing. He's really a superstar or a rising superstar in our field. And so we have this myth in science that, you know, science is really the product of superstars. And I, I use the pronoun he because invariably the superstar is a male and 99% it's a white male. And my first lesson here learned throughout a lot of this work is science is really done by teams. And in science, we don't like uh, to learn from anybody else. We kind of think we're too smart. Um, for that, so we reinvent the wheel every time. But if we only looked at the business world, uh, there's a lot of literature on what's now known as the failure of the super chicken model, hence my cartoons. And uh, there's a nice story. This is the reference. You can listen to Margaret Heffernan's TED Talk in 2015 about some experiments that were done with chickens where productivity is really easy to measure because you can count the eggs. And so they took some super chickens, they laid a lot of eggs, put them in one team, took some average uh, laying eggs chickens in another team, left these teams alone for some time. And the experiment cited here describes how after a few generations, the super chicken team is very unproductive. It's been decimated by the competitive nature of the super chickens. Um, while the average chicken team is happily um, living along and going on being productive. So what, okay, what does this mean for science? Well, I'm going to give a field example and I'm going to share some science, but I also want you to pay attention uh, to the team composition. So this is an experiment or a project we had in a small uh, Greenland glacier. Um, in West Greenland, Sakharlipsermia, right here. And this glacier discharges in Sakardlik Fjord. Um, it's about 150 meters in depth, and the fjord is blocked off by Jakobshavn Ice Fjord. This glacier has not been doing anything dramatic over the last decade. It has retreated a little bit, uh, but it's fairly stable. And, and that's the reason why we decided to go there for, for a field experiment. And uh, what we were really interested in is studying the glacier ocean exchange. So we picked a glacier where we could actually work at the ice ocean boundary. And this work was funded first by a foundation grant through the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. So you'll notice there are a lot of hui 
collaborators on the teams, and it was later the analysis was funded by a grant from the National Science Foundation. So the motivation for going to a mid-sized glacier with a fairly clear ice front was uh, this, this idea that's been talked through in a number of talks through the series, there's a vast literature on it, which is that melting at the ice front of tidewater glaciers in Greenland is strongly influenced by subglacial discharge, and in particular by subglacial discharge plumes, which originate uh, when you get localized subglacial discharge. And so one thing to remember here is that the melt rate is a function both of the thermal forcing of the ocean, so your temperature, but also in these melt parameterization and conceptually of the ocean velocity in the vicinity of the boundary layer, in the boundary layer. And the, the reason for this is higher velocities are associated with higher levels of turbulence that allow mixing across the boundary layer. So this is the kind of question that we were, we would ask or we thought we'd try and answer at a glacier such as Sakhar Loop. And, and it's from a model study that Donald Slater did a while back. So this is a MIT GCM run of uh, melting at the edge of a uh, vertical glacier. And in these different runs, Donald took the same amount of subglacial discharge, but distributed it in one channel, five channels, 10 channels, and a multitude of channels. And the take home message from this particular paper, so you get one plume, five plumes, and so on, is that the, when you distribute it over a wider, larger number of channels, you get more melting. And so here we were trying to understand, well, great, but in practice, how many plumes are there? How do they affect the melting? And so we, we went off to the field. And again, this fjord is closed, so you can't access it by boat. And so our operations had to rely on small vessels that local Greenlandic fishermen uh, have brought over land into the fjord. They use them for fishing. We use helicopters to transport all of our gear. And we camped uh, for about two weeks at a time at the margins of a glacier. Not a bad camping spot. And we traveled there in 2012 and 2013. We did surveys. We were really focusing on the ice ocean interface. We mapped bathymetry on the way. So this is the field team of 2012. Sarah Das uh, was the project lead, a glaciologist, myself an oceanographer. We had a Remus underwater vehicle engineer, uh, Robin also Remus engineer, uh, field engineer support, and Becca Jackson who at the time was a graduate student with me. We also had two local fishermen on our team. So we surveyed the properties and we brought, you know, these new tools to adapt them to working at the margins of glaciers in Greenland. Remus is an underwater vehicle. You can see it here. This is a small Remus, a Remus 100. So this is it in the water near the glacier. And we were able to complete several sections. Remus goes up and down. You'll see that in a minute. It can collect temperature salinity data, backscatter, velocity, um, but for navigation you have to deploy a number of buoys that allow it to be tracked acoustically. Um, and we, we were able to collect sections within about 150 meters of the ice front. And uh, Laura Stevens, uh, with the help of others from the team, analyzed these data. And I won't go into a lot of details, but basically by mapping the change in properties um, along temperature, salinity, and turbidity sections collected by Remus. You can hear, see the Remus track here going up and down. This is 150 meters from the glacier face and farther away. We identified the existence of two um, types of water masses, which because of their properties, we knew had to be produced by discharge of fresh water at zero degrees Celsius um, at depth. And so what we learned from these surveys is that they suggested that this glacier had two discharge plumes, D2, a smaller one, and D1, a larger one. And Laura then went on to ask, well, 
white two plumes. She constructed the catchment basins for this glacier. And, and there's really one major one, C1, another smaller one, C2. Uh, the channels are roughly in the middle of the two catchment basins. They have very different discharge rates. These are summertime discharges. C1 is a lot larger. And indeed, the water masses that we saw near these channels, not in the plumes, but this is a result of, we attributed to be a result of plumes. D1 had fresher waters. It settled higher up in the water column. D2, lower discharge, saltier water, lower down in the water column. We went back in 2013, um, another field team, some of the same people, but now we had a different autonomous vehicle that I'll show you in a minute. So Hanu Singh, who's a robotics engineer, uh, now at Northeastern University. Again, two local fishermen, um, two postdocs, Clark and Ken. Laura Stevens joined us on this trip, and again, a, a field engineer. Um, and we went back, and this year we had a jet yak. A jet yak is a surface autonomous vehicle, um, which you can pilot from a small boat, and you can send it right up against the edge of the glacier. Um, and it has a temperature and salinity uh, system on a winch that worked some. Um, it also carried an acoustic instrument that measures ocean velocity down to almost the seafloor in this case. And the big advantage and several other sensors is you can drive it up and down. And what was really interesting in 2013 um, at this glacier was that when we got there, there was this big, really turbulent plume that emerged at the edge of the glacier. None of the two plumes that we had inferred the existence in 2012 were at the surface in 2012 when we went there. But in 2013, one, the biggest one, D1, was uh, definitely at the surface. It remained there for the entire duration of the field campaign in July, about two uh, weeks. And so we could drive the jet yak in this nice um, radiator pattern. Just kidding, but I always make this joke. It's really hard to drive even a powerful uh, vehicle because of how strong the currents are uh, in this patch of waters that surfaced. We also collected CTD data both from the jet yak and from the small boat as well as uh, from helicopter deployed probes. And um, what th these were really amazing data. I think they were one of the first surveys of a plume uh, that surfaced. There have been others since and we we found that the waters at the surface, this is temperature, this is salinity, this is dark blue. It means they're a lot colder than anything around it, a lot saltier than anything around it. And indeed, if you look, the dark profiles here are temperature and salinity and the dark are from profiles through this plume. You can see this thick layer, about 20 meters of deep waters that has a weld. It's colder and it's saltier. And in fact, because it's colder and saltier, it's unstable. Um, and so this represents a plume that rises, reaches the surface, but then has to settle a depth. And these, in, these measurements were really important. Ken Mankoff took the lead in analyzing some of the data, velocity data, profile data from this plume to show that um, this plume roughly agreed with what we'd expect from analytical uh, plume theory, but that the upwelling cone was really tiny, maybe 20 meters in diameter, quite about a bit smaller than the patch that you'd observe at the surface, which was maybe two to 300 meters in radius. And this is because once your water rises, it spreads out before it ducks down. Okay. Um, so then, you know, you come back, you have a lot of data and, and there's still a lot of work to do. And so the other team that worked on this project is really an analysis team. So these were people who did not participate in uh, the field work or most of them didn't and or at least didn't necessarily collect the data they were working with. Uh, but they continued to analyze the data. And, and there's a couple new faces here. Claudia Chinedez is a fluid dynamicist 
fluid dynamics expert, the Woods Hall out Pluderman is a Remus expert that, that really were brought in to help with the analysis. Eva is a, was at the time a graduate student in Spain who was visiting us. Bobby is, is a graduate student now, still working in some of the data. Donald Slater, Till Wagner were uh, postdocs. And so some of their work, Eva asked the question of, well, why did the plume surface in 2013, which was a relatively low surface melt year from Greenland, but it didn't surface in 2012, which was a whopping surface melt year, as these estimates show. And she actually, digging through the uh, historical uh, or, or existing images, we found that the plume had surfaced early on in the 2012 season, July, 2012, June. But by July, when we went there, it was below the surface, which was again, very counterintuitive. And the reason for this she showed is that these are temperature and salinity profiles. Gray is 2013, um, red is 2012. In 2012, this is salinity. The water at the surface was a lot fresher, a lot more stratified, also subsurface, a lot fresher, more stratified than in 2013. And this is again a non-intuitive result, but it shows how the discharge, the large discharge in 2012 was able to accumulate so much fresh water in this fjord, and the numbers roughly agree, that it prevented the plume from emerging through much of the summer by essentially building a freshwater layer above it. Um, there's a few implications here. One, it's about our ability to identify plumes uh, from surface expressions. Second, we care about plumes because of the melting, they drive up the glacier. So a plume that reaches the surface or the near surface versus a plume that equilibrates deeper will drive a different uh, pattern of melting. And finally, if you're interested in the upwelling of nutrients and the upper layers for biological productivity, these two systems have a very different stratification which will affect the biology. So, so then we carried on the sort of thread and we said, well, we observed the circulation, especially in 2013 where you learn from the 2012 field season, and, and I think we were a bit uh, more experienced about how to make measurements at this particular glacier. This is a section collected in 2013 along this line. It's a velocity section. And what you see is this jet deriving from our plume, D1. It's, it's right below the surface here. Remember, it comes out of the surface here, but then it ducks down. Um, and then there's various other circulation patterns. And this is what the fjord surveys show at 30 meters throughout the fjord, this big jet, but also this flow along the glacier face um, around 30 meters. And again, a different circulation pattern with a reverse flow and flow along the glacier face around 70 meters. So Donald asked the question of, well, what is this fjord scale circulation due to? And our hypothesis was we think it's due to the plumes. And this is an interesting question because we think a lot about plumes and the melting um, inside the plumes. But plumes are tiny. In this particular glacier, we think there are two. We've argued that they're really localized. And yet when we say they're really important for melting, what we mean is they're really important for melting over a very limited surface area when this glacier has a front of about six kilometers. So what about this fjord circulation? Is this driven by the plumes? Because ultimately circulation implies melting or at least it influences melting. And Donald run the MIT GCM. He knew what the plumes looked like because we had observed them. And so he could initialize the model with these plumes. And he showed this is again, same depth, 30 meters, 70 meters that indeed D1 would result in a jet associated with a recirculation that would drive flow along the glacier face. This is D2, deeper down, uh, counter to the clockwise circulation driven by D1. D2 drives this kind of circulation and again, flow along the glacier face. And when you 
we have to use a, we did not measure melt rate. It was, it's really hard to do uh, uh, from oceanographic measurements alone. We did uh, estimate melt rates using a melt rate parameterization in the model. And the take home message here is that once you include the circulation driven by the plume, you get a doubling of the melt rate than you would with the plumes alone. Okay, so the fjord scale circulation adds an amount of melting uh, roughly equivalent to the sum of the two plumes. Um, lastly, and, and this is just the last example for this uh, project, could we balance mass at the glacier front? So again, another subset of this team came together, Till Wagner uh, led this study and so we said well we've made all these measurements um, can we balance mass and so what we're testing is this idea that or we're imposing that ice flux plus retreat must be balanced by melting and calving at the glacier face um, we didn't have direct estimates of calving we've had some indirect estimates of the number of calving events that i won't show here um, for the sake of time, but ultimately they cannot provide us with quantitative estimates of calving. So this will be a residual. But we can estimate the ice flux using ice velocity and ice uh, thickness, and then we can estimate the retreat through uh, images over the summer for, for this glacier, over the years when we made the measurements. Uh, there's a lot of spatial heterogeneity in the retreat to some extent in the advection, though we smoothed it a bit here. These two terms get summed and then they give you this uh, gray curve here. So this is what you have to balance with uh, melting and calming. And we have melt rate to our best estimate. Again, not inferred from observations, but inferred from a model informed by some of the closest to the glacier observations that we've been able to get next to a glacier. And this orange line are the melt rates. This is a pattern uh, from the uh, experiments that Donald led and very high melt rate where the plumes are weaker but non-zero elsewhere. But the point is that only in the vicinity of plumes are the estimated melt rates even similar in order of magnitude to what you need to balance mass at this ice front. Everywhere else, they're about two orders of magnitude uh, less. So the inference here would be, well, it must be all in the calving, except really we didn't see a lot of ice in this fjord. And so while we cannot quantify uh, the amount of calving, the fact that there was no ice tells us that while calving might be important, we are off in our, very likely we're off in our melt rate estimate. And we're not just off by a factor of two, which is what Donald argued we could get from including the fjord scale circulation using the current parameterization, we're off by an order of magnitude. Uh, of two. And, and this agrees with uh, some recent results that have come out of the Lacan study. Dave Sutherland, who estimated melt rate uh, directly by looking at changes in the glacier phase, showed that we're greatly underestimating melting if we use the current parameterizations. And Becca Jackson used ocean data uh, essentially to make the same estimate. So I'm going to leave with this. Uh, is, is still a big question uh, in ice ocean. And, and so, great, this was, I would say, a pretty productive project uh, by my standards. You know, we produced a bunch of papers, we identified the plumes, measured plumes, used models, estimated uh, mass balance, um, and, you know, pushed the field forward a little bit. And, but, but really, this was successful because of teamwork. Um, if you look at these teams, uh, they include women, they include senior people, early career people, they include local knowledge, um, which was indispensable. I don't know how many times uh, having 
Greenlandic fishermen saved us from a complete failure in the field season. Their knowledge and adaptability to their territory was really key. Um, we also had glaciologists, ocean engineers, robotics experts, uh, fluid dynamicists, um, oceanographers all working together. And so this is my experience of productive teamwork. And um, again, we can take a step back and look at the business world. Um, there are plenty of studies, and I'm going to cite two, that show how science done by diverse teams is a lot more productive than science done by individuals or homogeneous teams. And I'm going to cite two, Wooli et al. and Engel et al. Uh, again, business world, productivity is measurable and very important. And so um, hence the fact that there are many experiments trying to quantify what is the secret formula to productivity. So I like this study. Um, they did a, a number of experiments in which they put people together and they looked at what the most successful team characteristics were. And the three characteristics that emerged uh, are the following. The first is non-hierarchical. Members contributed equally to the team's discussion and the success of the team. Members had stronger social sensitivity, empathy. They're aware uh, of each other's uh, feelings, interactions that allows people to find space in the discussion. And lastly, teams with more women outperform teams with more men. Interestingly, they found that the cumulative IQ of the teams did not map onto higher productivity. Okay, so you're probably thinking, yeah, but that's field work. I've known this all along. In field work, we need diversity or we need different skills. At the very least, it's easy to think why you'd need engineers and so on. But I'm gonna pull in another example. And, and here I'm gonna take a step back and talk about community. Um, and my argument here is that if we really want to make progress in a problem that is society relevant and urgent, we really want to work as a community and be as inclusive as possible because ultimately we need all the help we can get. And this is to be contrasted with a culture of competition and individual achievement, which somehow we are trained into in our science upbringing. You have to be the first to publish. In fact, you have to be a lead offer uh, to demonstrate that you have to have contributed to something. Or you need a single offer paper to show that you're productive, or you need to destroy the competition, maybe by being overly aggressive and putting them down at every chance you get, or by not sharing data information that you think might help them. And again, if we look at the business model, um, here's one reference, if anybody's interested. Uh, this is known, it's now being called as the diversity bonus. There's a nice book. Um, again, it analyzes the productivity of teams and uh, corporations. And I would argue that this also works within scientific communities. So the best example uh, that I've been involved with to showcase this, because I don't want to stand here and just lecture, this is all based on things that I've experienced, has been my engagement with the ice sheet modeling intercomparison project. And so for those of you who are not familiar with this project, uh, up to now, until this, this particular uh, AR6 assessment of the IPCC, uh, we did not have the contribution to sea level rise from ice sheet wide dynam dynamical uh, ice sheet models. And, and so the goal of ISMIP 6 that is nicely described in a paper, notice that this is quite old, was that we, they would take any output from the climate model, CMIP 6, and for those models that were coupled, so ice sheet models coupled with an atmosphere ocean or climate model, uh, you could do this directly. For other models, um, you'd have to do offline uh, coupling. And as we stand now, this 
has happened, and there are very few coupled models. So most, most of the efforts of ISMIP-6 have gone into uh, this offline coupling. And so I think it was early 2017 that Sophie called me up um, and she said, Fiamma, you know, I, I, we need to do this thing for ISMIP-6, but we don't know how to do the ocean forcing. So can, can you help us? And I thought about it a minute and I said, no way, this is really hard. Um, we don't know how to do this. Thanks, Sophie, bye bye. But Sophie's persistent, either that or she, she didn't find anybody else foolish enough to say yes, but she called me again after six months and she said, we really need some help in getting the ocean forcing. Can you help? This is way outside of my expertise. Uh, what, what we need the, to do here was take output from climate models. This is an example or, or a schematic for Antarctica. The climate model is assumed to do okay. There's many caveats here on the continental shelves, uh, but the climate model doesn't have uh, the cavities. It doesn't have the ice shelf. So the idea was to take output from the climate model and specify essentially basal melting in the cavities for the ice sheet models. In Greenland, similar or maybe more complex problem. We have output from climate models. This is a section across the East Greenland shelf, warm water, cold water. Somehow you have to take this output together with output from a regional climate model such as MAR or RACMO and specify a forcing that comes into the fjords. There are no fjords in uh, ocean models that are running climate models and specify a forcing at the margins of glaciers. Um, so I don't, didn't really know how to do this, but I've been around long enough and uh, did I, I did something that I really do all the time, which is ask for help. And my help comes from the community that I've interacted with over the last decade. Many of these uh, team members who ended up being the team members of the Ocean Forcing Group for ISMIP uh, came from past interactions, summer schools, such as the Advanced uh, Climate Dynamics course that is, is run by the University of Bergen and others. Uh, where Toure, Mathieu, Hélène were students or lecturers. Um, others, it comes from meetings that bring the community together. So again, a very diverse team, Nico Xeiler, ice sheet ocean expert, a number of ice sheet modeler, glaciologists, Toure, myself, observations. Toure is an expert in oceanography around Antarctica and under the ice shelves. Dennis and Donald, glaciologists, Alice, Chris, uh, climate model analysis, and, and Xavier and his group for surface mass balance. I won't go into too many details. I'll just, for those interested, this is a complex problem. You need to take into account the fact that we don't uh, have fjords. We don't really understand uh, what the influence of ocean forcing on calving. And we had to adapt to the needs of the ice sheet models and what forcing the ice sheet models could accommodate. So for example, in Greenland, we generated a high resolution forcing, which involves extrapolating the CMIPS into the fjords and providing those models who had calving parametrizations uh, with ocean temperature essentially and, and melt rates if you wanted them. For those models that didn't have a calving parameterization in these runs, uh, Donald and others developed a retreat parameterization. And I don't want you to read this, but uh, we have CMIP output, we have regional climate models, we need bathymetry, we need parameterizations that need to be calibrated by data, we need to work with the ice sheet modelers, this is a really complex multidisciplinary problem. And again, we don't have time to go into the details, but the exercise for both Antarctica and Greenland did generate uh, projections. Maybe the lesson to be learned here is not how uncertain or not these projections are, but that it's a huge step forward to have generated these. Um, I like showing these numbers. Um, Antarctica 16 simulations from, 
13 modeling groups from nine countries, Greenland, similar number of simulations, uh, I might have, yeah, from eight countries. The, the thing here is ISMIP is a model for community inclusion, for generating something that is accessible to anybody who wants to participate. And you can read the um, papers, they've just come out in a special uh, issue of the cryosphere. And, but, but really the point here and the point of showing you the team is that this is a community effort. And it worked because of the standards of collaboration that were set by the community. Lots of people, lots of women, lots of people from different countries, uh, an ISMIT workshop. And one of the reasons why this particular engagement between the sort of ocean forcing and the ISMIP happened is also thanks to other workshops. These were organized by this grassroots organization, Griso, email me more if you want to know more. But over the last decade, we've been organizing meetings. The goal has been to facilitate interaction and meeting between the different communities engaged in the problem. We've had marine mammals people at this meeting. We've had scientists from Greenland. We had representatives of the Greenlandic uh, government. We've also done them joint with ISMIP a number of times. And this is where we facilitated the interaction with uh, the models. Right, so this is my conclusion. Um, it's, it's really a um, call for improving our practices um, as a community to really foster faster scientific progress. And I, I think the way you do this is to facilitate a healthy and interactive community. And many of you have contributed to this through your attention to early career, through the open workshops. But I, I also think there are many of us just by nature of our trainings uh, that forget about this. And, and I think as much as we spend time getting specialized and doing our science, we also need to spend time understanding how do we prepare future generations? How do we develop inclusive, diverse communities that are really going to make the science thrive? And I'm going to stop here. Thank you. Oh, I can't stop here. This is the title for uh, Ellen's talk next week and uh, slide. So thank you so much, Fiamma. I, uh, clap, clap for everyone. I, um, if you want to ask any questions, I already saw one, uh, Olga raised her hand there. Best thing that you can actually do is either type the question in the chat or um, just say Q and then I'll let you talk. So um, perhaps Olga can unmute herself and she can ask the first question. Hello, great talk, Fiamma. Um, a quick question about your first part about the circulation of the fjord and melting. The way it sounds, maybe I misunderstood, and you please correct me, that it seems that the results imply that the effect of the fjord itself on melting is somewhat passive. In a sense, without those plumes, no melting would happen even as because of the recirculation. So whatever you get is initiated by plumes and even in the um, presence of doubling of those, the right. effect of the fjord itself is pretty much negligible. So that's a really good question, Olga. And, and I think one way to think about it is when we talk about velocity, uh, that you in our parameterizations, what is this velocity? This particular fjord had pretty small tidal velocities. So in a sense, one of the things to think about is what is that velocity? Are there tides or are there 
uh, smaller scale uh, features that we are not factoring into this parameterization. So I wouldn't say the fjord was passive. First of all, it, it provides the heat to drive the melting. And um, there's probably some background uh, velocity that is due to tides or maybe internal waves that is there even if you didn't have the plumes. You always have, even without the plumes, you always have the sort of uh, circulation driven by melting. But I, I think that's, you know, your question reflects that that's kind of one of the key things to understand are how to improve our melt rates so that we get numbers that are uh, consistent with observations. So I have another question by Inga Smith, if you want to unmute yourself and perhaps start your video. Thank you. Um, yeah, so thank you, Fiamma. That was a great talk. I enjoyed the science, but I've actually just got a diversity question. So in terms of early career researchers, um, you've clearly shown that diverse teams are stronger. Um, but if the hiring process still favours super chickens, is it better for an early career researcher to be selfish and act as a super chicken rather than to join a diverse team for their PhD or postdoc? That's a very good question. So I have two answers. The first one is we, that's, that would be you and I, we, we need to change the hiring culture and in our evaluation uh, for faculty job researcher positions, uh, take into account contributions to other aspects of scientific productivity. And this is, uh, for example, engagement uh, with diversity or ability to foster inclusion, ability to participate in teams, and, and really not discredit somebody's work because they have participated in team efforts. For the early career, I think what's important is maybe that they're, they stress to their letter writers. Uh, we always include uh, references when we apply for a job to emphasize that their team efforts um, were valuable and were an integral part of the team. Um, much of the work that I showed relied on the creativity and input of the early career who participated. And so um, when I write letters, I really emphasize that they were not there along for the ride. I, I think, but this, you ask a really important question. And again, I don't have solutions, but I think as a community, we can think about what these solutions might be. So, yeah, that's a really important point. Like, oh, you have to make changes at all levels, but also uh, indicate what is diversity at all levels. Because some people may say, when you show a diverse team, well, that's not diverse at all. So, how do you deal with that? How, who decides what is diversity? Right. Um, I mean, we could start by including more women. Uh, I always laugh, I know Helen Fricker does too, when we get a proposal to review that has 10 white males as co-PIs. Well, that's not a very diverse team. That's an easy thing to remark. Um, I think we are leaving a whole section of productive uh, potential collaborators behind by not uh, being inclusive. And science is suffering uh, as a result. So um, I think diversity is, is a lot of different things. And I, I think they emerge when you start looking at the backgrounds of many of the people that um, we recruit or traditionally have recruited or we consider superstars uh, in our field. And I, I really think we need to uh, change that. Uh, there are a lot of people who have a lot to give and, and we're leaving behind. So the next question is by David Sutherland. You want to unmute yourself? Yeah, my video is not working. Um, you answered some of it through Inga's um, question too, but I guess you know the thing we haven't talked about is funding and the world of funding and, and funding agencies. What do you think the role for them is? 
Right, great question, uh, Dave. So I, I guess I have a couple of comments uh, here. One is, is that I, I think I speak now for the funding agencies I know the best, which is really National Science Foundation and, and a bit of NASA to some extent. I think the program managers are really sensitive to broadening participation. At NSF, we have to write broader impacts. Uh, NSF can nudge communities in directions, um, but also reviewers can nudge funding in, in directions by calling out lack of diversity or a team that is all uh, senior people um, and, and really does not provide opportunity uh, for growth. So, so I, I do think funding agencies have a huge uh, power here. Um, right. And, and uh, I, I think, you know, some of the workshops and efforts uh, that I've shown that you have been involved in too, and, and you know this, have only been possible because we had funding for a workshop or because it was relatively easy to get funding for the early career. So there was no question that there was funding for early career to participate. There were no obstacles and, and, and so on. So I, I do think uh, funding agencies are important and I, I do think dialogues with program managers are, are really important. So do we have other questions for Fiona? If you want to type in Q or your entire question in the chat box. So it seems that... Hester, it looks like Sasha has her, has her hand up. Okay, Sasha Carter. Okay, unmute yourself. Leidman, actually. Hi. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks, Fiona, for a great presentation. Um, you said you worked with two local fishermen on your expeditions. Um, I was wondering if you could just expand on your experience working with them. How did you get in contact with them? What inputs that they gave? And how have you been sharing information, both them sharing their indigenous knowledge and you sharing your, your results back to them? Yeah, I mean, that deserves a seminar in itself, but I, 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 I mean, from a, um, how did they get involved? We needed um, people with boats in this fjord and we needed logistics support. So as often happened in Greenland, you called somebody you know who called somebody they know and 10 people down the road, you find somebody who has a boat and um, hopefully you find an interpreter. So, so in this case, we, it took a lot of efforts, but eventually we were able to find uh, Ove. He's a local fisherman. He has several boats. He fishes and hunts in this fjord, especially in the winter. And he agreed to this job. It, it was a job. And so there was a lot of back and forth. Uh, the interpreter quit the day we left. So that wasn't great. There was a lot of hand waving. But I think uh, what worked uh, with them is we didn't really have a, a language in common, um, but we were very accommodating of each other's needs. Uh, scientists, we jump into the field and we're like, we're here, let's work 16 hour days. And then we noticed that they were getting really tired. So we said, no, actually, we don't need to work 16 hour days. We're reliant on them. Um, we need to accommodate. Um, we had meals together, funny story, you know, we invite them to have a meal with us and we're like half the crew is vegetarian. So we're making Trader Joe pesto and pasta and the two fishermen come and eat and then they look at us and sort of say, is this it? And then they walk back to their tent and cook about 10 pounds of seal meat in a stew and come back and offer us some saying, you guys are gonna starve. Um, so I, I think, we used their knowledge of the place. We asked them, can we camp here? They said, no, can we camp here? They said, yes. We trusted them and I, I guess they trusted us. We relied on them for safety. Um, we explained, you know, you're, you need to tell us what is dangerous. Uh, they're a cultural um, 
barriers. Greenlanders tend to say yes all the time. It's impolite to say no. So you need to really convey that it's okay to say no if something is, is dangerous. So I, I don't have uh, rules, but I know that they were incredibly um, supportive of the field work. We had the opportunity of work with them over several years and and really engage with them and and I guess we listened to them and uh, that that helped a lot but there are many ways of engaging with local people with indigenous people um, that that I, I think as projects such as navigating the new Arctic this is an NSF project but I know they're similar in Europe we need to uh, work with people in Greenland more. Many of us have been making measurements in Greenland for many years without really uh, interacting with the Greenlandic science community or, or the local community. And again, I, I think this is not uh, a method to do science inclusively and it's, it's something we can work on. Awesome, thank you. Oh, should I read a, a question or two? Benjamin, with teamwork in mind, do you think we need to rethink how we conduct and examine PhD students? Even with a good supportive supervisory team, it can often feel like a somewhat solitary push. Um, and one where opportunities for collaboration are limited because ultimately it has to be an independent piece of work. This is, this is a challenge. This is a community challenge. I do think a team can leave room for individual creativity. Um, I had only the first offers listed in the papers that came out of the project I was showing. They were all early careers, um, at least at the time. They're now full-blown scientists. They, they led this work. We just created the environment in which they could do it. And so I, I would say the teamwork, uh, the people who engage in it can still get credit for having led the analysis, even if there are a lot of co-authors. And it's up, up to us to um, really emphasize this. Again, in our evaluations, uh, in our um, letters of reference, the question is not, can you do a first offer paper, but can you demonstrate that you can do creative, uh, independent, I don't know that the word independent works, but can you lead creative scientific work uh, even while working with a team. And um, this, this, is, uh, this is how I would phrase it. And Heike, you asked what was wrong with the first choice camping spot. Yeah, this is why you need Greenlanders. The first choice camping spot was in the fan where when a subglacial, a super good, super glacial, a lake, a marginal lake actually drains, it floods some of the area. And of course that was where we were planning to camp and the Greenlanders were like, no. So I'm back again. If there is anyone else, I lost all the chat boxes. So um, if there's a final question, then I think Fiamma is happy to. Either so, I'm back again. If there is anyone else, I lost all the chat boxes. So um, if there's a final question, then I think Fiamma is happy to. Either I'm back again. If there is anyone else, I lost all the chat boxes. So um, okay, I'm hearing a bit of echo. Final question. <laughs> Great. I. I think we were good. I don't want to keep, especially the Europeans here forever, but. Um, feel free to follow up. I'm very eager to keep having these conversations and, and offer the you know, really limited learning experience. I, I am sure that many of you have uh, many more that they, they can share. So thank you so much, Fiamma, and I hope many of you can join next week and Alan Anderlin and uh, Tevi will be chairing that session again. So thanks for a fascinating talk, Fiamma. Thank you very much, Fiamma. Thank you, Hester, too.